Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Mental Health Awakening 2. Um, and t today's topic of today's episode is PTSD. And it's going to be a really interesting episode because I don't think I've ever done an episode about PT P PTSD before. So it's going to be a really interesting topic. And today, me and Angela are joined with Amy. And uh, Amy has PTSD. Um, and it's going to be really interesting where Amy's going to be sharing um, a personal experience with P PTSD. Um, and I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna. I'm gonna stop saying PTSD because I've said it about five times now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna let uh, Angela introduce yourself, and then Amy can introduce herself as well. Hello, hello. I'm Angela T. Jackson. I'm a licensed professional counselor in the state of Tennessee, the USA, partnering with the UK. I'm glad to be here today and excited about our special guest. Now I'll say it this time, talking about PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> and my name's Amy. I'm from London in the UK. I'm a healthcare assistant uh, for people with bladder and bowel care issues. And I... Thanks so much for having me uh, to talk about PTSD today. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be really interesting, and we wouldn't have thought we'd be speaking about PTSD, considering how many times we've already said it. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so I guess Amy, if if you wouldn't mind just saying a little bit about what PTSD is. Yeah, sure. So PTSD stands for post traumatic stress disorder, and uh basically it's it comes from reliving traumatic experiences that you've been through in the past and the different ways that that manifests in the mind and how that interprets into your everyday life so a lot of people get flashbacks or like very strong mental images of things or very strong associations with things that they see in real life or nightmares or you know just very high anxiety levels and also as a lot of mental health conditions it obviously coincides a lot with you know depressive moods and things like that okay, okay. that 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 but that's really interesting so uh, so with, with your experience with um PTSD um like what, what, what you diagnosed like per, per because you had a, a, an experience is, is that how you got your diagnosis uh so what actually happens was in like the second half of 2021 I started having really bad nightmares um almost every night and they felt very real and it was very scary and very overwhelming and I was also having um kind of like hallucinations as I was waking up and going to sleep often as things like spiders or rats mm -hmm. and like so for example I would be in bed like falling asleep and I would like think I can see a spider like running down the wall or like you know coming down on a web off the ceiling and like because I don't really feel comfortable with a spider crawling around while I'm sleeping that wakes me up a bit and then it's not actually there so it was things like that as well but the nightmares especially were very intense they all feel very real when I have nightmares I don't really know that it's a dream so there's I don't know I've heard some people say that when they dream they kind of know that they're dreaming but I definitely do not know that I'm dreaming when I'm dreaming um so even and I guess like I don't really have a sense when I'm dreaming of me as a real person I only have the sense of what is going on in my dream at the time um so I can't make that difference so everything just feels very real and because I was having those problems and I had already um had issues with anxiety and depression in the past I was already taking antidepressants and I'd already tried um like cognitive behavioral therapy and things like that you know that are like first line 
therapies for depression and anxiety so after I was getting all these really bad dreams and like heightened anxiety because of that I went back to the doctor um at which point they um did like one of those tests that you fill out about different circumstances that you have in your life um and how often those happen and then from that they said that the most likely thing was that I have PTSD but that they couldn't pinpoint exactly what was causing it because there seemed to be quite a lot of things in my past that had was causing you know different um levels of trauma and things like that okay okay that 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 is really interesting um mm -hmm. like to learn because um like I, I i don't like really i haven't really known about ptsd um and what it can do um and yeah it makes perfect sense though what you're saying like um like not knowing if a dream is real or not um like if it, it because if you think about it having these dreams you do sometimes think they're real when you wake up um sometimes um and and if you are scared of spiders or rats anyway it it, it makes it worse I, I imagine sometimes you may even maybe not want to go to sleep to experience it um when yeah. it happens but so like when it that like does it continue like is it is it like a is it a daily thing would you say or does it happen every now and then like what, what, how, uh, how yeah so the so the bad so the nightmares they are yeah every night but things like the like the weird hallucination type things with the rats and the spiders they they are less frequently that's more if like I'm really I feel quite drowsy and I have some so kind of in-between state of being awake and being asleep. So that happens less frequently, thankfully. Um, and it used to happen more when I was taking something to help me sleep, which I've now stopped taking because I just, I didn't find it helpful enough to continue taking it. Um, I just found that it made me tired, but it wasn't helping me to stay asleep once I was asleep. And that was my main issue, the fact that I wasn't staying asleep. So I didn't want to continue taking them. So, um, but yeah, the nightmares are like very much continuous. And, you know, some of the things I have nightmares about are like really out there and just, I don't know, very... Um, objectively scary but other things I have nightmares about are just like very, very anxiety inducing just to me personally and it'll be like I don't know I have dreams about like you've you've sent this really horrible thing to this person and then I'd like wake up and I'm panicking and I have to check that uh, I actually haven't done that mm. uh, obviously there'd no, be no reason why I would but it just feels so real and it's just like why have I done that Mm. um yeah so it, it's like things like that is just yeah I, I kind of have like more of the anxiety inducing very much related to my own real life dreams and then the nightmares which are like feel a lot more separated to my normal life I guess when I'm sitting here now being myself mm. <clears throat> I appreciate you sharing this um P PTSD is not discussed enough. It's one of those diagnoses where people have associated this particular diagnosis with people who have been in the military or something of that, that level of trauma. Um, and we're finding out that more people uh, just in day-to-day -day life experience post-traumatic stress. Um, there's something that's interesting about it because it can be your personal experience that has actually happened, right? Something that has actually happened in your life that creates the level of stress or, and this is where some people, uh, this is where it kind of gets tricky, it can be a perceived threat 
it can be, uh, and I'll use the word imagined, right? If, if you think that there is something uh, that you're, you're afraid of or hesitant about, like you mentioned, spiders, I don't do spiders. <laughs> I would, I would, I would flip. Okay, <laughs> this session <laughs> would be over. Uh, but just the thought of there being a spider of a certain size, of a certain color, uh, on the floor, or if you know, out of your peripheral, if you think you see something uh, moving, maybe it's a, uh, maybe it's the rug, maybe it's something on your desk, you know, just, just kind of the, the reaction to it is very real. It could be mental. It can even show up in physical features like you're describing, uh, in your dreams. It, it feels like things are real. You're seeing things that are not necessarily there that you haven't experienced, but, even the physical reactions during that wake time could could be, you know, uh, kind of puts you on alert in a way. So uh, it it can be things that you actually experienced. For example, like, you know, maybe there was a biking accident or a boating accident, and there was, you know, a flip or something that you didn't expect that created that picture or that ex the full experience of, of something traumatic, or I've, I've connected with people who are afraid to drive cars. They're afraid to just get behind the wheel and even attempt. So that creates those very similar feelings uh, as far as that, you know, the stress. Another thing is if you hear about someone else's experience, it can affect you even in the same way. So the way that you described not necessarily being able to pinpoint what has happened because of so many different traumatic experiences in your past, I can, you know, I can agree that that's, that's a possibility, definitely. Yeah, for sure. I and you know, I went to the doctor and I spoke to them about what uh you know what it could possibly be. I didn't expect at all that they would tell me that I had PTSD. As much as I as much as like I I do think a lot of the time it's it's associated, you're right, with like the military and war and those sorts of flashbacks of that sort of thing. I feel like that's you, I don't know I feel like even when you're studying like English at school and you read over those war poems and a lot of them are about flash that's the association we have with PTSD but I think that yeah so I was very surprised when my doctor told me that he thought it was that and um yeah I just think that it's definitely something that needs to be spoken about a lot more because even I don't know even if you don't some people feel like their trauma isn't worthy of being that mm. traumatic in in some sort of sense when it's being compared to like you know people who have gone off to war and seeing yeah. people dying your trauma is never going to feel worthy enough to have that title I think that that makes a big difference on how people perceive it because they just don't they never would have thought that that is their you know that is what could possibly be what's going on with them yeah. if they haven't been through something massive like that yeah absolutely and you know I don't I can't remember if Mason mentioned but we connected because we're a part of a lot of different groups uh, regarding our, our medical condition. I know you, you probably mentioned it in the last episode, <laughs> but we both have Crohn's disease. And mm -hmm. we talk about that. We advocate for um, uh, awareness and for care and for education around that. But in terms of PTSD, there are certain medical exams or medical related experiences that I can think of having had this diagnosis for 23 years, there have been things that either happened that were unexpected, uh, that were painful, 
that you saw me swallow. <laughs> there we go. So like you said, the, the, the feelings of anxiety that come along with that, the feelings of even depression or even, you know, th that, that fear that comes over you. It's like, oh, almost a, a cringe, as the kids say now, cringy feeling uh, because the, those feelings are heightened. And, and that's, that's one of those key words there. It's the, the memory and the thought of it can heighten those emotions and like the, ooh, the fear, the dread, all of that. But I can think of certain experiences that I, I always have to slow down and prepare myself. Okay, I'm gonna encounter this again. What's gonna happen? It happened before. I need some time. Let's wait, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so to that point, and, and like what you're saying, it can be, people can experience PTSD in different settings. It could be medical. It could be, uh, oh goodness, maybe they have, you know, had, had a different type of an accident. Maybe there's been a slip and a fall. Maybe they don't um, stand in the bathtub without shower shoes because of something like that. It could be anything that creates that level of, stress and, uh, and that intensity of those feelings of anxiety, anxiety, hesitancy, fear, um, the flashbacks. And something else that happens is you almost get the feeling that certain thoughts are just intrusive. They just pop up in your head when you're really not focusing on it, you yeah. know? And I can only imagine that happening to a person being asleep because you're relaxed, you're, you know, you're seemingly ready for a long slumber. It's just, you know, peace, unwinding, and then boom, here come those thoughts, those fears, those things that are triggering. So yeah, yeah, I appreciate you sharing this information. <laughs> definitely I feel like as well sometimes it's just like you're you know some of the dreams that I have it's just like oh I didn't even know that I was that I don't know worried about this particular thing but here we are like I didn't know I had quite this much built up stress and anxiety about it but clearly I do um but what you were saying like about the physical responses like so I I don't have Crohn's disease, but I have had the whole of my large intestine removed and I have a, I have a stoma permanently. Um, and I had my condition since I was like four months old, since my mum started feeding me like pureed food. So when I was just having like breast milk or formula milk, I was okay. Um, apart from well I had had quite a lot of health problems when I was born but like in terms of my digestive system I was fine and then I got to like four months old when I started having pureed food and I could like not go to the toilet at all and uh, like so when I was um, I was looking at my medical records the other day and I was first um, prescribed Senna when I was exactly four months old uh, which is pretty crazy for like a baby of that size to be given oh. any sort of laxative medication. Um, and so my, I don't know, like at best I was going to the toilet like once every two weeks, uh, even then. Wow. And like from the whole of my early childhood, I was having a lot of different treatments and medications like and I don't know, investigations done, you know, and I was having to take a lot of medication orally. I was having to have a lot of medication rectally. I had um, Botox in my anus. I had loads of just very invasive stuff happen and they didn't really find what was really, well, they didn't sort it basically until I was an adult. So, um, so yeah I had quite a difficult time of that growing up but I had realized that um so in my more recent life having sorted my physical health out and I'm a lot better now I have realized that there's a lot of things like physically responses that I had like for example last year I had to have 
pelvic floor physiotherapy because I couldn't even put in a tampon or I couldn't have penetrative sex because I had had so much done to me rectally that you know the whole of my pelvic floor has just gone nope we are not letting anything in there so even my vagina was like no absolutely not so you know and until yeah, I couldn't insert a tampon, I couldn't have penetrative sex, anything like that. And when I was starting my job at the uh, bladder and bowel care clinic that I work for, um, I'm not a nurse, I'm a healthcare assistant, but you have to like observe the nurses for like six yes. weeks before you start. And one of the nurses I work with, she does like rectal exams. And obviously all the nurses do vaginal exams Um as you know you would expect from a bladder and bowel care facility but um one of the nurses she does a lot of rectal exams and when I would watch her do rectal exams I felt like I was going to faint and at first Mm -hmm. I didn't realize exactly what the problem was and I would have to stand there and go Amy you're going to have to breathe really really well right now because otherwise you are about to pass out and it's not going to be good but when I was but obviously for a rectal exam, your anus is like very tight. You know, you can't see anything except the finger go in. Whereas yeah, with a vaginal yeah. exam, you can see what's going on. So I was just like, oh, I don't really get it. But I was just like, actually, no, I I know where all this has come from. Like, yeah, I'm just yeah. scared of anything like that. I cannot even look at this or think about this without it making me feel very unwell. And so after those six weeks, I was so happy that I never had to look at anything like that again, because I was just like, oh, I really can't. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That the very exposure triggers your experience. Yeah, just just being exposed. Yeah, absolutely. That's a perfect example. Mm -hmm. Being easily startled. Is that something that you've experienced or you did mention most of your experiences during your sleep but would you say being easily startled yeah I I, yes I'm very easy to startle (laughs) yeah Yeah. and I don't yeah I I feel like a lot of the time like I'm kind of a I, I do feel like a lot of the time like my anxiety is sort of heightened anyway like whenever anything uh like uncomfortable is happening I just feel like I'm very on edge about things anyway and then you know after that I find it very hard to get back down to kind of you know like normal um -hmm. I just kind of feel like I'm living on on edge for you know some periods of time if yeah if if I'm out with a group of people and one person you know isn't very well or they're like they're really upset about something and then I feel like you know for example I I just feel like even after any situation that might have been there is resolved like my how I'm feeling about things is still very heightened Mm, yeah yeah you you've done an amazing job sharing the experiences what it looks like what it feels like to you what can you share about different tips or strategies that minimize the symptoms that you experience do you feel like you have some level of control or is everything still at the same level for you uh right so I feel like one of the main things that people really kind of underestimate to a certain degree and I think here in the UK we like obviously we have the NHS which is which is really great but I feel like a lot of the time in the U in the in the UK if you go to the doctor for any sort of like mental health problem what normally happens is they give you like a a first line antidepressant so some type of SSRI Uh, normally like sertraline or citalopram something like that and they also refer you for cognitive behavioral therapy right because that in the UK tends to be like our first line sort of thing it's cheap you can do it online there are group versions and then if 
that isn't helpful, then you can go on to do it one to one. But it tends to only be six sessions and the qualifications the person doing CBT needs is less than, you know, like someone who's been studying to be a counsellor for like four years or someone who's a, a psychologist. And I would say like to a lot of the people that I know who have had mental health problems, the whole process that we go through in the UK can be very off-putting because you're seeing that you're being put on a medication and then that you see that you are being given this therapy that probably isn't very well catered to your needs because it's kind of like a one size fits all thing they're trying to do with the money that they have which is completely understandable but I feel like for some people they kind of give up hope there and they're like therapy isn't for me and I think really like with things like PTSD you really need something that gets to like the core of what the issues are and a lot of the time you're going to need to, especially, you know, if you are in the UK, you want to get that on the NHS and you don't have, you know, the money to spend on it. You have to jump through a lot of hoops to get what you need. And personally, I, um, I started in January doing um, psychodynamic psychotherapy because I have a lot of stuff that is clearly rooted into my early years and my you know my childhood years that yeah. some of it like I wouldn't even be able to pinpoint because you know I was just a kid and that's all very hard to process and I feel like to be able to sort out and get to the things that are really impacting you you need to be able to get to the source of them because I feel like a lot of other things it's you're just trying to cope through it mm -hmm. um whereas you know if you have like depression anxiety that is coming from stresses in your everyday life I think cognitive behavioral therapy can be really helpful but I think when it comes from more deep-rooted things you're going to need something different um, and for me, like, uh, this is the first time I've done therapy and I've really felt that it's beneficial um, because it's really getting to what my problems are rather than just trying to deal with my problems in the here and now. It's kind of like, OK, how do we unpack this for you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it, it, de definitely. There's a need for space to explore long term mm, exactly yeah yeah, yeah which absolutely. is exactly what my psychologist says she's just like yeah this is a space for us to explore all of that <laughs> we can explore what you've been through we can explore the nightmares that you're having now we can talk about whatever you want we've got this time together it's an open space see exactly you know <laughs> you that's know right <laughs> <laughs> wonderful it sounds like you have a good fit because you know when you said the six weeks and I agree with you sometimes programs uh, uh, offer what they have maybe what they're limited to uh, but that that something of this nature as you stated before you experience certain things in your childhood you yeah. know maybe, maybe there are some things that your mother or your parents could contribute as far as different experiences, even that they believe may have had an impact on you. But dealing with those feelings personally, it definitely can take um, some, some processing, some different techniques, time to explore, uncover. And you said it perfectly, unpack. <laughs> you have to be able to have the space to unpack that. And yeah. yeah. Yeah, and discover. It, it really is a discovery. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. I feel like I've learned so much about myself only since January. So, yeah, it's wow, that's definitely beautiful. discovery. Yeah. yeah. 2023 is uh, flying by already. Um, but, um, I know, it's crazy. It's very, it's very <laughs> crazy. But, yeah, I think, like, with maybe little things to maybe you or it, to other people, like a little thing, it could be, which isn't a little thing to you, but it, like, like, like it could even be uh, something like um, you knock the bin the the uh, the bin over at primary school or something, 
and that 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 just stuff like that and it other people don't think it's a massive thing but in your mind you don't know what affects it um 100% um and well when we speak about doctors and, uh, and like um and stuff I completely agree like I've I've spoke about um like let's say um with my with my Crohn's if I if that like someone asks how like, I go to an appointment and they ask how you're doing um and I might be talking from a mental health uh, um situation um like the like saying that maybe like with the, the like the COVID um affecting like people who are in in that compromise, and I'll say no, I, I'm sitting on for ages, on, and obviously they're not talking about that. They they're talking about how I'm actually doing, like if my Crohn's high or if, I, if, I, if, I, if I'm experiencing any of that. And then when I did say that, I just got said like okay, but how are you actually doing with your Crohn's? And then so yeah. like they they brush that aside. And I think a lot that like the healthcare and like NHS is very good to have because you don't have to pay for treatments and and stuff like that. That's the benefit we have in the UK. But upon that, like support with maybe mental health does need to be improved. Even like um, say you you have a um situation um to to go in and like it might be for it might be to do with health. Not so you would go in to um the hospital and you would go into the A and E if 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 you did have a situation with something, if it's Crohn's, if it's someone else and it's an emergency, you're in there for an emergency. And you and you're put into the A and E, the ER in the, in America. Um and I I, I I always say I think it's not great. It's not it's not right that, that happens because it's not like we've got bruises and stuff like that. So I think lots does need to be actually be improved with like hospitals, doctor surgeries, and how they go about things and how they actually talk to their patients as well sometimes. Because um, I think it's always important in any job. Um, if they're having something that has happened in their personal life, um, they shouldn't take it out on maybe the patient because it's, not, it's, it's not their fault. Yeah. And yeah. if that is the case, if you are having a, a rough time, which is completely understandable. Just don't go in. If it, if it if it don't like don't go in because I've I've had certain situations where like I've been to a doctor surgery and, and they just talk to you uh, not very nice and, mm. and and then I I always feel personally like if anyone talks to you in a bad manner like you have the right to say something back because it's it's, it's it, it works both ways but at the same time you kind of think to yourself is it really worth it. Because it, if you do it, are you not going to get seen? Are you not going to get support? That's the thing you fear. But yeah, mm. I, I think massive improvements do, do, do need to be made with like healthcare, hospitals, support. Um, because especially with getting diagnosed with different things, actually. Because yeah. Um, yeah. I, I remember getting diagnosed with Crohn's in 2017 and they just give me a leaflet. To, 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 they didn't say like a, a leaflet. Tell me what, what, about what Crohn's was. Um, mm. and, and I think that's probably the same with a lot of diagnoses. Like they don't actually; they just tell you have it, uh, let it go home. Um, and I think things do need to be explained um, a little bit better. Um, but yeah, yeah, lots of improvement do need to be made uh, for, especially in mental health, because and PTSD. Because PTSD, uh, until Amy spoke about it today, I didn't know an awful lot about it myself. So. It's good that you've done that today, Amy, because you've raised so, awareness. Uh, yeah, I would say, though, one of the good things about PTSD is that a, a GP can diagnose it. Whereas, like, one of my younger sisters, she's waiting for, like, an assessment for ADHD and ASD. And they've told her the waiting list is, like, three years, mm. which wow. is just crazy. Yeah. Wow. And she's she's only in, like the first year of secondary school in the UK so she's 12 and obviously now is really the time that you'd want that diagnosis for the support for her for her learning you know because you know in three years I mean she would have done most of her secondary school so it's a bit like too little too late really isn't it yeah yeah mm -hmm. I, I have um like autism myself um and do actually on the podcast do different things about autism and ASD um and I I got diagnosed when I was nine and yeah a lot like you say that is the perfect age to get diagnosed with support and mm -hmm. education because education is is, is dreadful it's, it's dreadful for people who are on like on the spectrum um yeah and, for sure 
And if you do get that support, it's great. Because uh, I, I went to a mainstream school and then I transferred to a special school. But without getting that diagnosis, it's awful. It's very hard to actually even get that to be done. Um, and like I think now, diagnosis of older people actually are getting uh, uh you see a lot more. But it, I, 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 it's 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 hard because you tend a lot of people tend to have to go like private to get it and and pay actually to get a diagnosis of um yeah ADHD and autism. It's hopefully hopefully she does get it though. Um, yeah i hope so yeah um but last thing to finish off guys um is there any one does anyone else want to say anything um like i don't know about um ptsd or um any, any last thoughts that any of you want to add on angela do you do you, do, you, do you want to start do you do, do you have anything I, I will start. I was going to leave the floor to our guest. <laughs> okay. But I will say to any of the viewers and listeners, if you are experiencing any feelings, any thoughts, any um, anything that you believe is out of the normal, that you believe is excessive in nature, request an evaluation. A good place to start would be your primary care doctor, you know, if it's, if you notice that you're feeling uh, more stressed than normal, they can help you identify whether or not um, you have a certain level of new things in your life, a certain level of new stressors in your life. May, maybe there's a normal feeling of anxiety, but then you identify where it's more in excess, for example, your, your primary care doctor may be the person to refer you to a mental health specialist where that can be uh, explored, further evaluated, and you can get the help and treatment that you deserve. Definitely. Yeah. I, I also think in the UK, we have a lot of, um, like a lot of our GPs, our primary care doctors, they work in quite a big surgery so they'll normally there'll be like quite a lot of them so if there's one that you don't like very much you don't think has been very nice to you in the past ask for someone else like it's not worth going it's not worth going to someone you don't feel comfortable with and it's not worth not going because you feel uncomfortable about that person it doesn't matter who your registered gp is on a bit of paper you can see anyone at that doctor's surgery so just ask for a different one and yeah yeah it it's not it, it won't affect anyone else's day. It will just make yours better. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Because I, when I was seeing my GP, I, I, I always ask for the one I'm used to that I've had for so many years. And she's very popular. So, uh, <laughs> like, like you have to, like, really book it in advance sometimes. But, yeah, I completely agree. But just see the people you're, you're, you're comfortable with is much better than seeing some person that doesn't get you. That's right. That's right. It, I agree. In America, we recommend the same. If there's a person that you're connected with that just doesn't feel like they're a fit, make the switch. You can mm -hmm. make the switch. 100%. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, and, awesome. Um, thank you, guys. Uh, and Amy and Angela, it's been, it's been great. Thank you for inviting me. It's been, it's been really fun. And to anyone who's seen this episode today of Mental Health Awakening 2, we hope you've enjoyed it as well and take some from it because PTSD definitely does need to be spoken about more. And it's great to hear about Amy's experience um, today. And yeah, she's done really well raising awareness and, and sharing her journey as well um, with PTSD. About the hundredth time we said PTSD, <laughs> haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> but that's been great. Well, thanks, Amy and Angela. It's been awesome. Thank you. Thank you.